be next week, but I won't be here because it's my birthday. I'm going to go away. Next. Hi, sweetheart. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. So good to have you here today to worship together. You know, the Bible, if you take just a, a little phrase, can make it sound so simple. For example, in the book of Nehemiah, it says, so the wall was finished. And if that's all you had, you think, piece of cake. But of course, we know better because it took a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of issues and problems came along. Today, we're going to look at uh, the progress. Up to this point in the book of Nehemiah, we have seen him preparing the way. Now it's time for action. And so now is the time for action for you as well. So we want you to stand and let's sing together the praises of the Lord. Hey. Nice to see you. Good morning, church. Oh my goodness, let's try that again. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Before we get started today, I have been told that there is a very special birthday today. So we're all going to wish Maria Cooker a happy birthday. You're not allowed to hide. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to hide, so you're not allowed to hide either. Look at Jay. So we're going to sing happy birthday. <clears throat> happy birthday to you. Special visit from Josh. We're good. <laughs> All right, we got. We we just need one second because Josh had a job to do. So now that his job is done, he can get the words up there. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday! If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies If you've been trying to feel the same old holes inside There's a better life There's a better life If you got pain, he's a pain taker If you feel lost, he's a way if you need freedom, we'll save him. He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of the day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. When there's a better life, there's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, 
somebody testify if you believe it if you receive it if you can feel it somebody testify if you believe it if you receive it if you can feel it somebody testify if you believe the world
worship you. Church said, Amen. Amen. Please say hello to one another.
Don't say anything. Good morning, Second Cape. Good morning. Good morning. And a special good morning to visitors and anybody watching out there in Cyberland. Um, it is absolutely gorgeous outside today. Um, some of us might go to the beach, some of us might go fishing, but whatever we do, we can all do the same thing. And the answer is found in the book of Titus. We can be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for everyone. So just keep that in mind, whatever you do today. Um, just a couple of announcements. The, the quarterly business meeting will be coming up July 28th at 7 p.m. right here in this, in this room. Um, in his wake is Monday, August 1st. Bill Fossbender is here today, so if you want to get involved, make sure you catch him. And the Red Cross Blood Drive is Tuesday, August 2nd, and Doris is here, so... If you have any interest in that, please see Doris. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Our scripture is found in Genesis 6, 13 through 18. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 18 inches of the top. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. Good morning. Um, I just want to begin this morning's prayer with a, a quick 10-second moment of silence where I'm going to ask you all to pray for the person next to you, to your left, to your right, to your front, to your back. There's so many of us out there, um, and I discovered this, I've been seeing this over the past several weeks where people have problems, broken hearts, um, family situations, personal situations, and they never say anything about it. They just suffer in silence. Um, they never ask for prayer. And, and that's one of the most important things we can do as a church is pray for each other. Um, show that love, the love of Christ. So I'm just going to ask us to take a, bow our heads, take 10 seconds, and just pray for the person around you. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we celebrate you, we love you, we worship you for the opportunity to come together 
and worship you in, in, in this free country, Lord. You, you've just blessed us with absolute abundance. Father, and as a country and as a people, we've been slowly turning our backs on you. And it's getting more and more, uh, it's speeding up more and more as time goes by, Lord. And, and I, I pray for revitalization of this country, of the world, with all the, all the wars going on, rumors war. Lord, I pray that we snap back to you and we turn to you for all our answers. We don't rely on our own worldly thoughts, Lord, that, we, that as a country we turn to the Bible for our answers. And we make you the center once again, one nation under God. Father, again, we thank you for this church. We pray that as a church, we continue to grow in our faith towards you that you continue to teach us, that you grant us your wisdom, Lord, that we follow your word in all we do. Father, we pray that you prepare the next pastor of this church and prepare the committee to ask the right questions, to give the committee the wisdom to follow your word, to follow your direction in selecting the next pastor. Lord, we, we pray for Pastor Randy and his family. As you've placed our burden on, on them to help us get through these times. Father, we, we lift the people of Ukraine and even the people of Russia up to you, Lord, as this horrible war continues and, and literally thousands of people are dying every day right now. Lord, we pray for your intervention. We pray for the sick and injured in our church, Lord. We pray for their healing. And we pray for the leadership of our church. Again, that you walk closely with them, that their hearts always remain open to you, Lord. And they seek your will. We thank you for your day, your day of rest, your day of worship, Lord. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Matt. Uh, he whispered something to me uh, just before stepping up that reminded me of a story about Charles Spurgeon. They say that he had a tremendous uh, sense of humor and uh, one day, there was an elderly lady came up to him and chastised him for his humor. And of course, this is back in the Victorian days when perhaps it wasn't as kosher to uh, have humor in the pulpit. And so he listened to her, and uh, she uh, gave him a good talking to her about his humor in the pulpit. And when she got finished, he said, Lady, if you only knew the many, many things that run through my mind to do that I don't do, you'd be standing here thanking me. So I, I brought that up because uh, just before he came up here, he turns to me and said, is it my turn? And in that flash, I was very tempted to hand to him the notes and say, yeah, it's my turn, and just pray and let him take it from there. Only problem is I don't know if you'll be able to understand uh, what I have written down here. If you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Nehemiah chapter 3. Nehemiah chapter 3. Resolute toward progress. The entire book of Nehemiah is about his resolution, his firmness to get the job done and completed. And there was a long backdrop to this as we come to chapter 3. And I want to start with an illustration that comes out of the pine forest of Europe and South America. There's a curious insect by the name of pine uh, processionary caterpillar. And it uh, gets that name because, number one, it likes to eat pine needles, and number two, uh, they go in a string together, one after another, and they just follow one another. 
Well, back in the 1890s, there was a uh, scientist who decided to have an experiment. And he got this giant flower pot, and then he got some of these caterpillars, and he lined them up all the way around the edge. And then he put in the, the uh, flower pot pine needles, which is their favorite food. And then he just sat back and watched them. And sure enough, they did what they do. They proceed one after another. And they went round and round and round, day and night, for an entire week, until finally they all died of exhaustion or starvation. Why did they do that? It's because they favored activity over accomplishment. Even though their food was just an inch away from them, they went into activity instead of accomplishment. And as I thought of that story, it kind of parallels the situation with Nehemiah. In Nehemiah, he prayed, he fasted, he mourned. When he had the opportunity to speak up to the king, he was ready and he gave his uh, spiel on the status of Jerusalem. He even added, can you give me a pass to the king's forest once we get there? He even had an escort given to him for his travels, so he didn't just talk about going, he actually traveled there. And once he got there, he got on his horse and he inspected the walls, and then he got everybody together and had this one giant pep rally, and they finally just said, let us rise up and build. But if the storyline ended right there, he would be no better than them caterpillars just going around and around and around. Brothers and sisters, we can pray. We can mourn and weep. We can fast. We can travel. We can ask. We can inspect. And we can get everybody all riled up with enthusiasm. But I got news for you. There's only one way to do it. Finish it. And that's to do it. And that's what he did here. He did it. And that's what the third chapter of Nehemiah is all about. Now, on the surface, when you come to this chapter, you think, oh, no. Here's another one of them big sections like First Chronicles, nine chapters of names, or Matthew 1, or Luke 3, the genealogies. But I have found that this is a fascinating chapter in the Bible. And I have uh, titled this Progress, but there's two significant thoughts in this chapter. The first thought is project management. And the second thought is people management. Before I pray, I want you to think about which is harder, to get the project done or to manage the people. As long as I live, I will never forget what somebody said about a pastor in Nuego, Michigan. It was a Baptist church, and he had been there 10 years and suddenly resigned. And when asked why he resigned, this person told me he announced to the people he was sick and tired of being a people broker. I think the weariness of trying to manage people can be overwhelming, more so than getting the bricks and mortar and wood that you need for the project. So as we work through this, I want us to come to an appreciation for what the next man is facing coming into this place. The project needs to progress forward but the people need to cooperate and to work together to make that happen. Father in heaven, we thank you for this chapter that is in the Bible. We thank you that all scripture, every word is God-breathed, comes from you. And we take it as your inspired word. And even though there's names that we know nothing about, there's facilities that we've never heard of, don't know why they were there. We do know that in the end, 
the wall was completed and the gates were installed. And this chapter shows to us the power of people. The power of people when they think with one mind to complete the task. And may you inspire us today to work in that way so that when we come to chapter 6 and we read those words we began the service with, so the wall was finished, that we can look back and we can see that it's more than just a project. It's about people working together. We pray for the next pastor coming in. We pray that you will give to him the gifts to be able to finish the project. Lord, we pray that you'll bring in many people to help. We pray that many will come to Christ in a saving way. We pray that his gifts will match the needs of this congregation and that one day we can look back just like we do at chapter 3 of Nehemiah and see that the project was completed. We pray for all of this, for your name to be glorified just as it was when the walls were finished in Jerusalem. In his name I pray, amen. amen. Now I'm going to throw a lot of little facts and figures to you and we're going to kind of speed dial through those as much as possible because there's a main thrust in this portion of scripture that I want to present to you. Let's look first at the project management. Now we're going to be all over the place in this chapter, so have it ready so that when I reference a particular verse, you can kind of move and shift towards that. I want to talk about key words, prominent words in this chapter. The word built, which refers to the construction aspect. And I emphasize that because later, we're going to look at another word that has a different slant to it. Six times the word built. Two times the word laid is mentioned, and that is in reference to the foundation. It's a wonderful thing to have a wall, but you have to have a good foundation for the weight of that wall to be upon. And then a most significant word that I'm going to stress later is the word next. And actually, it's in a phrase, next to them. And you can kind of think where I'm going to go with that because we as people have to work next to one another. And then the last word is the word repaired, which means to strengthen and to reinforce. Now, keep in mind, there were already stones there that had been toppled down. So they were reusing a lot of the materials but they had to reinforce it so that it would be strong enough for the progress. The purpose of this project was to glorify God and to give them security. Glorify God and to give them security. There's an old saying in architecture that goes like this. And there's a couple of you in the audience. Yep, I've heard that only about 10,000 times. Form follows function. Mike uh, was mouthing it for me. Form follows function. And what is meant by that is that when you build something, it has to actually serve a purpose. And, of course, the purpose is twofold. To give God the glory, because as long as the walls were down... Nehemiah said, you're in great trouble and shame. He actually said, you're in derision. You're in trouble. The people in the area despised the people in that area. They taunted them. They mocked them. And this was an area where God could be glorified by putting these walls back up, but also the function would be that it would bring security for the people inside the city of Jerusalem. Now, it takes a lot of people to make this happen. When a lot of people focus on one purpose, in this case, two, the glory of God, and second, the security, great things happen. Now, to apply that in our scenario, we want to glorify God, but we want to reach people for Christ. We want to rebuild the spiritual walls 
bringing people into the family of God, working together to rebuild the walls of Second Cape. Now, a lot of people are involved here. 38 people are mentioned by name. Now, a lot of different other groups are referenced here. And out of all those names, there's one name that is missing. And it's the author of this book. And you're saying, well, what about what you see in verse 16? Look at verse 16. After him, Nehemiah. But if you compare who he is the son of with Nehemiah who wrote the book in chapter 1, you see that there are two different Nehemiahs. What I want to stress here is that Nehemiah did not put the emphasis upon himself. He was not a celebrity builder. He didn't have his own TV show to demonstrate what a wonderful wall builder and gate installer that he was. His emphasis was upon finishing the project so that the enemies outside would see that God's name had been lifted up and honored. I think you can see the parallel here. What we want to see is over a period of time for the spiritual walls to be rebuilt here so that God's name can be honored and so that people will look at this place as a lighthouse that brings people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when they did this work, it happened in a pattern. And we've already referenced this several different times when we've been going through these gates on Communion Sunday. It goes in a counterclockwise direction. It starts with the sheep gate and goes all the way around and comes back to the sheep gate. But it also came in stations. It wasn't like he said, oh, we're going to have a work day and everybody just find something to do. Even, even our work days are not conducted like that. Uh, the skipper has a list and he says, you go here, you go here. And there's no choice in the matter. You just do what he says. You go where you're supposed to go. Stations. And Nehemiah had this all organized so that people were working not just in one spot congregated together, and I think that was the secret for why he got it done in the 52 days, because people worked in their own sphere of influence. God loves organization. Now, one last thing about the project that I want to emphasize before moving on to the uh, people is all the many different places. And here's where I'll kind of give you a little bit of a travel uh, in this chapter. Notice in verse 1, the Tower of the Hundred. And then also in verse 1, the Tower of Hananel. And in verse 11, the Tower of Ovens. Verse 25, the Boltress and Tower. And 26, the Projecting Tower. Now these towers were in the way. Uh, for those that have ever done a remodel project, you'll know that there's electrical issues, there's plumbing issues, there's support walls issues. Uh, one project that I did in our last house in McBain, I had to do seven times before I got it right. And I'm, I have to tell you, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. I like to get things done the right way. But when we bought the place, it had an opening from the kitchen, one of these windows, kind of a serving area into the next room. It used to be originally a window, and when they added this extra room, they just kind of left it open and made it like a serving area. Well, we wanted to enclose that for, for a particular reason, so I go and I get a piece of sheet drop, drywall, whatever you want to call it, cut it out, put it in there, and get my mud out, and I, I'm here to tell you, drywalling and concrete work is some of the hardest work in the world. If you have a lot of it, hire it out. That's my advice. But this was a little small project. And, of course, you know, where it was situated, I could get and I could kind of look down the line and you could see the flaws. That's why it took seven times before I finally was able to get it. Uh, if I was being paid... I'd have made about 10 cents an hour. It was, it was that, uh, that bad. But these towers, along with the broad wall, the houses, 
And how about this? How would you like to work around a graveyard, a cemetery? It mentions the tombs of David and enters an artificial pool and enters an armory. All of these had their issues. The broad wall, I'm taking it that it kind of widened versus the rest of the wall. And these towers that came out, they would have particular issues in order to connect with. And so this project involved a lot of planning. For Second Cape, going forward, it's going to take, and, and I've used this word in our transition team, and this word has been used uh, to chemistry staffing, and I don't know if I've used this word broadly in a public way, but it's going to take an entrepreneur. It's going to take somebody who has new ideas on how to reach out into the community with people. And what that means is you've got to work around those towers. You've got to work around those areas that are issues with people today. The Apostle Paul himself said, by all means, I will use every means to reach people. Now, he never said, I will change the message. He just said, I will change the means in which I will go out to reach them. A good project manager, especially a rebuild like this, has to work around a lot of issues. Your pastor coming in is going to have to work around a lot of issues in order to reach around people. And I'm not talking about the building over there. I'm talking about the building here. I'm talking about the people building. We have to work around those so that we can glorify God. And number two, reach people for Jesus Christ. Now let's go to the people management. As I said, there's 38 people mentioned by name. There were more than likely thousands of others that were working on this project. If you go back to uh, chapter 2, it says, let us rise up the build. So it wasn't just a solo project. It was all of the people. And they had a lot of cooperation. I mentioned 15, 14 times uh, the phrase next to them. Uh, the first occurrence of that is in verse 2. Now let's just think about that for a moment. Personalities. Backgrounds. Ages. Generations. We could go on with a lot of list of areas where when we have to work next to them, almost everybody is just a little bit different. But the one commonality that we have is that we love the Lord and we want to serve him and come together for the singular purpose of working in his kingdom. Another key phrase that shows their cooperation is seven times it says another section. In other words, they drew encouragement by finishing a section praising the Lord for that accomplishment, and then moving on to the next. Good coaches never point to their team and say, my main goal is to win the national championship. The first goal is we want to win the conference. We want to do that first, and you put all your effort into that. Then you go to the next section, the next level. This was a co-ed project. This will show you this next to them, and ladies, you're going to enjoy this. Notice in verse 5, we'll read the entire verse, uh, excuse me, verse 12. Verse 12, next to him, Shalom, the son of Halohesh, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired, he and his daughters. You know, it's easy to conceive, well, this was all the men and the women were in the kitchen cooking to help them, but no, the ladies were there as well, and they were working on this wall. They had many different callings. Uh, the book of Romans chapter 12 talks about all the various gifts of administration and evangelism and teaching, 
And there were all these different callings that were involved in the building of this wall. And the main piece of advice I would like to share comes in a little phrase at the end of that passage in Romans, and it's this. Let us use them. It's very much like Nehemiah. You can pray, you can mourn, you can fast, you can ask, you can go, you can inspect. But unless you use those gifts, it's of no use. I used to get very frustrated, in fact, I still get a little frustrated at the number of people who go to seminary and they never use it. Uh, my best guesstimate uh, for, for the school that I attended, probably 25, 30% is about all that went into pastoral ministry. They're just going to school to learn the Bible. Uh, if I ask Matt and, uh, and Pat, did you go to law school just to learn law? No, you, you, you do it to use it. And God gives us gifts to use it. And they certainly did use their gifts. Notice the number of different types of people. In verse 1, you have priests. In verse 5, you have nobles. Verse 7, a governor. Goldsmiths and perfumers. Really? Perfumers? Now, if, when you think about it, you've got a, what I would kind of conceive as a, uh, a delicate group in the priest. You know, they probably didn't have a whole lot of callus on their hands. They were probably not out in the field very much. And yet you've got also perfumers and goldsmiths. You've got people in the jewelry shop out there working. God can use anybody. Rulers of districts, verse 9. Temple servants, verse 26. Guards, in verse 29. And merchants, in verse 30. I don't think that's an exhaustive list. I think it's just illustrating the fact that if you're willing to use your gift, God can use you. He can use anybody. And we all have a gift that can be used for God's glory. Some it is giving and contributing. Some it is speaking. Some it is giving. Some is in mercy and encouragement. We can all use our gifts in the total project of serving him. Now here's where it gets a little sticky. When you have people, you have problems. I know of a pastor who's in a church uh, out west and I think on a good Sunday has about 30 people. And when I was talking to him, and this was when I was in my uh, first interim, and I think on, on a good Sunday we would have around 325 people there, his comment, and, and I couldn't disagree with him, he says, more people, more problems. <laughs> and that, that's very true. And the problems that they had here are not unique to them. They're not unique to us. When you have people, it doesn't matter geographically. It doesn't matter ethnically. It doesn't matter where we come from. When you get people, you're going to have some issues. And let me show you some of the issues. The first one is insubordination. Notice in verse 5. And next to them, to the Tekoites. I've often wondered if these were the descendants of people from Tuckahoe. You know, what do you think? I'll let you investigate that. Here's what I wanted to, to emphasize. But their nobles, I want you to listen to this, would not stoop to serve their Lord. Isn't that sad? There should be nothing that the pastor, the elders, the deacons, the church secretary, people that sing on the platform, there should be nothing beyond us that we'd be willing to step in. I, I, I wrote uh, in the email this, this past week, when you see something, do something. You have a piece of paper. Let me tell you a real quick story I heard at the conference. This was really neat. 
And it was even especially neat when we saw one of our grandkids do the very same thing. The, the speaker at the IPM conference, he said, you got to look for leaders. And he said one Sunday, and he's in a small church, one Sunday he saw three teenagers coming into the church, and he was behind them. And there was this uh, coffee cup that was all crumbled up on the ground. And he said the first teenager went right on by it. He said, I don't even think he saw it. The second teenager came by it, saw it, and just kicked it. And the third teenager stopped and picked it up and put it in the trash. So after the service, he went to that third teenager. He said, hey, you got leadership skills. How would you like to uh, take down the tables every Sunday? Yeah. So the next Sunday, not only did he show up, he had somebody else. And then two weeks later, he had organized a chart, a system where you could get everybody get. A leader. Nobody is beneath doing hard work, whether it's unstopping a toilet, picking up paper, whatever it is, when you see something, do something. And these nobles thought it was above them to stoop to do God's work. They were also informants in chapter 6, verse 17. These nobles sent letters to Tobiah, one of the three amigos that was a difficult person, so they were informants from the inside to undermine. Do churches ever have inside moles? Sadly, they do. And Paul talked about that when he left Ephesus. He said, not if, but when wolves come in seeking to tear apart the body, you have to be on guard. These were wolves. And then there's Eliashib in uh, this chapter. He's mentioned as the high priest in verse 1. You'd think, Nehemiah's got it made. He's got the high priest working. The high priest is, is there. We, we're, we're okay. No. Eliashib was closely working, if you look at chapter 13, verse 4, with Tobiah, again, one of those amigos, and he was being unfaithful, but he was also involved in intermarriage because Eliashib's son intermarried with Samballot. Does that ever happen in a church? Where people from one family marry into another family, and before you know it, oh, we can't say nothing because that, that's a pretty good-sized block of people. We can't address that issue. You see, he had problems. Whether it was insubordination, being an inside informer, or being somebody that in, intermarried and got things uh, messed up. Now, in today's world, it would be the issue of intermarriage, not from a racial standpoint, but from a believing standpoint. Believers should not marry unbelievers. But this happens. And so Paul warns the church of Ephesus about this in Acts chapter 20. You as overseers have to watch for that. I know of a church, and I can't argue against what they do. And here's what they do. They have their elders standing at the door every week. And when visitors, guests come in, they're praying as well as greeting the people. And here's what they're praying internally. Lord, if these are people who might damage our folks, please send them away. Please alert us to what they may do. Because sometimes they can infiltrate. Uh, have I had that happen? All of the churches. Second Cape's not unique. No church is exempt, and we have to be on our guard. There were a lot of communities involved. Uh, just going to run down through these, and then we're going to wrap this up. There were men from Jericho, verse 2. Uh, men of Gibeon, verse 8. From beyond the river, verse 8. 
from the district of Jerusalem, Mitzvah, and other districts, mighty men. There were people from all over. Now, if we did a survey, probably I'm the greatest example because I'm a hillbilly here in New Jersey. In all of my life, I never thought I'd live in New Jersey. But here we are. And it's been great. In spite of the hard nope, we're here. <laughs> and, and it's great. You know, I think, you know, fairly well we fit in. You've, you've been very tolerant of my hillbilliness. But there are other backgrounds that we have, a lot of them. I know there's people from Philadelphia. There's people from all over the country with different backgrounds. But when we come together, we're one family. You know, I, I would hope you would look at me as a brother in the Lord. And I would look at you as a sister in the Lord, not, oh, you're from this city or you're from this area, and, and you know, and kind of... Uh, target them to be a certain way. These people came from all over and they worked for one singular project. During World War II, in the defense of the Philippine Bataan Peninsula, there was a commanding officer who had a dangerous job in which he needed one volunteer. So he lined all his men up and he gave out the dangerous mission, and he said, is there anyone willing to step forward two paces and volunteer to do the work? He looked down at his clipboard and looked up, and nobody had moved. And he was raking them over the coals. Somebody's got to step up. And his aide whispered to him, sir, while you looked at the clipboard, the entire line stepped up. If God's family could be that way, all stepping up, all doing their part, it would be a different place. One last example before we wrap this up, and then I'm going to go back to that strange passage that Bill read earlier. I, I uh, kind of gave him a little coaching on this so that he wouldn't uh, get lamb blasted and I'm going to kind of retrieve him so that he doesn't get hit up on why would you talk about the ark when you're talking about Nehemiah. In verse 20, I want to read from the NIV because the ESV did not do this justice. And here's a prime example of the kind of person each of us needs to be regardless of our position in the church. Verse 20 reads like this in the NIV. Next to him, Baruch, son of Zabbai, zealously repaired another section from the angle to the entrance of the house of Elisha, the high priest. Now, going back to what I said earlier about all these different facilities, you can see this here, the angle it's another issue you have to kind of work around. But I, I thought, is the NIV right? It, did, did, did we miss something here? So I went to the original language, and sure enough, the word means to be hot, to be kindled, to be on fire. The most common use for this particular word is used for anger. You know, we say we get hot under the collar, or they're face is red as fire. When we get angry, there's a lot of emotion. Well, it's used in a good way here, and Baruch was zealous, on fire for the Lord. In the future Jenkins Free Translation, it will read like this. Baruch intensely got after it and got his section of the wall done. When we read in the Bible about Noah's ark, first of all, we don't know how long it took. 
Some think it's 120 years. I don't really think so. It's just a reference to how long it was going to be until the flood came. But let's say it took 20 years to build. All we got to read on is what Bill read to us. God gave him the specs, and then we read that it happened. But we don't hear anything in the scriptures about what probably did happen. I can imagine those three sons. I grew up in a family with two brothers. And whenever you went out to the garden to pick strawberries, we came back with red shirts. Because any rotten one, I mean, it's like we're zinging them. And I can still hear my dad, for crying out loud, pick the berries. Do you think for a moment that there wasn't a crowd of people mocking? Look at that Noah. What in the world does he think he's doing? We read it and it just the specs and then it's done and it's over. But it was not easy. Whether it was 10 years, 20 years, or even the 120 years, It was hard, hard work. I'm sure that there were times when he was on his knees, Lord, could you just give a little more definition to what I need to do right here? Because if you've ever been over to the ark in Kentucky, oh my goodness, that thing, tremendously intricate. If you've never been there, please go there. You will come away with a different appreciation for what Noah did. I hope you come away with a different appreciation for Nehemiah, the project manager, who had to manage the people, and come away with an appreciation of your incoming pastor that it's a big job. Support him, get zealous, get hot, get on fire to serve the Lord. Father, we pray that you will take all that we've uh, talked about today and use it for your name, for your glory, Lord, help us today just to rededicate ourselves to the cause. And the cause is not about us. It's not about protecting my turf. It's not about doing it my way. It's about doing it your way. And I pray that you will help us to be of one mind, one spirit, together to rebuild the spiritual walls here at Second Cape. Wherever that man is at right now, Please continue to speak to him. We need, in this place, a Nehemiah to get it done. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Please join us for our final song. Sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. to him I cling. In his presence, presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best song. Faithful loving service to
uplifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger, look above. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you. will obey. He is Savior wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help. Love lifted me. We ended on the right note, right? <laughs> okay. Let me just share this little little tidbit. Right after going to the conference, we took our three oldest grandsons uh, to go see a movie, and we took them out to eat. and And uh, we were standing there waiting for one of uh, the grandkids to come out of the restroom. And out comes of the restroom another kid that we didn't know, and he had the paper towel in his hand was wiping his hand and just threw it down. And boom, just like that, Hans goes over and picks it up. So what's Grandpa and Grandma do? You are a leader, okay? And we kind of pumped him up. Well, what if everybody here was a leader like that? Did, did you realize probably 90% plus of everything that gets done in a local church does not require an election? election to an office position, you just do it. So remember, there's only one way to do it, and that is do it. All right, go do it. <laughs>